So hi, I'm Tim Titus, Chief Technical Officer and Founder of Pass Solutions. I'm going to go into a demo of what TotalView can do for automating network troubleshooting. So let's dive in. So first thing is, is TotalView is going to deploy on a Windows virtual machine. So any version of Windows doesn't need to have a, a large deployment. A lot of other solutions say, gee, you need an eight-way machine and gobs of memory and gobs of disk space. Uh, we're actually very efficiently coded. So it's C and C++, which means in many cases, you can put us on a one or two core server with four gigs of RAM, 10 gigs of disk space, and we're going to be perfectly happy and actually give you snappy performance. When we deploy, what it's going to do is it's going to scan through your network and we're going to find all of your switches, routers, gateways, firewalls automatically. And then we're going to start digging deep into every one of those devices. Uh, again, the knowledge is out there. And if you knew what your network equipment knew, you could start solving problems really quickly. So as we deploy, we're finding all the devices and we're interrogating and we're very quickly going to start put to put red dots in front of devices. So we have a red dot here in front of the Sara switch. We can click into this switch. I'm going to see all of the interfaces. I see interface five has a red dot and 4% packet loss. Now, I'm sure if somebody told you, hey, we found packet loss on a switch port, you're going to say, do I care? I mean, after all, if that's a printer or a photocopier, nobody cares. But if there's a voice device here, if there's a critical server, if this is a trunk port to another switch, that changes everything. So really what this is, is what is affected by this packet loss? To answer that question, we expose all of the CDP and LLDP information. So you can see if there's anything spitting out CDP or LLDP on that interface. We also have a fully integrated port mapper to show what's plugged in. Here we're seeing there's one MAC address. That one MAC address associates with the HQ voice VLAN. We can see the, the manufacturer of the device. We have the IP address. We have the DNS record. Oh, wait a minute. That's our voicemail recording server? Okay, if we have packet loss to the voicemail server, that's going to cause choppy sounding voicemails. So I'd say that's a high priority problem. So now we know what's affected by that. Let's go see what the problem is. We click into the interface and we're seeing the utilization graph. And then below that, we see the packet loss graph. Below that, we see the plain English prescription and we're being told there's a cabling fault. So it's that fast and easy to recognize we have a problem on the Sara switch, we have a problem with interface five, that problem affects this voicemail server. Here's when the problem started, here's when the problem stopped, and here's what the problem is. That way we can immediately move to resolve it. Now, something else to recognize here is, that means a lot of these problems can be pushed down to the tier one help desk. It doesn't mean, it means that you don't have to have a senior level engineer involved on all of these trouble tickets. And I'll tell you, I haven't met a senior engineer that loves working on trouble tickets. So having this stuff pushed down is gonna make their day. Now, something to recognize though is, is that other monitoring packages wouldn't even be aware of this problem because the first thing is they're not looking at all of the interfaces. So they just wouldn't see this. Even if they were monitoring this interface, they wouldn't see it. They'd say the interface is healthy. Here's why. If we go over here and click on view error counters, it's gonna show all 19 of the error counters that we're picking up and analyzing. Other monitoring packages, they're gonna look for inbound errors and outbound errors. And in this case, they would declare this interface as healthy. We know the truth though, because we're going far deeper and we can say, no, it's not healthy. What you've got is a ton of FCS errors, some deferred transmissions, and some outbound discards. And by the way, all of these error counters put together with the interface type and configuration means you have a cabling fault. That way you get the root cause of the problem resolved quickly. Now, if you wanna learn about these error counters, we have a built-in engineer's library. You click on the error counter, it gives you the official IEEE definition, a more basic lay definition, and then all of the different causes as to where the problem can come from. That way you can get the root cause of the problem solved quickly. Something to recognize though, with all of these error counters checked on every interface of the network at every five minute period, what this means is if you drop or buffer even a single packet anywhere in the network for any reason at any point in time, we know about it. 
Okay, so let's put this together and do a root cause troubleshoot. I'm gonna to go to the path tab here, and let's say we have a user came up to us and says, hey, I had some problems with a unified communications call uh, that I had right before noon. I was doing from my PC to a gateway, and it was right before noon. Can you solve that? Most people are like, no, I can't, because I'd have to research every involved link, switch, and router, and look at all the error counters, and try and put it together, and the monitoring software really won't help. Here's how fast we can do this. You put in the IP address of their PC, put in the IP address of the gateway and click map. It's gonna analyze every link, switch and router to find out what are the involved link switches and routers to, to, that connect these two IP addresses so that you can path map. So here's the PC, looks like it's connected to the Pino layer two switch connected to interface seven. That interface looks perfectly healthy. Well, especially around noon when the user complained about the problem. Now, something to recognize is when we say an interface is perfectly healthy, it means perfectly healthy according to all 19 error counters. Other products, if they say an interface is healthy, you could have collisions going on and you just wouldn't know about it. Outbound, the traffic's going out through interface 25. And it looks like here, around noon, eh, there's some utilization, 75% utilization, but there's no packet loss and there's more bandwidth available. So that's a healthy interface. As we go on, we're going inbound and outbound on the Syrah switch. That looks good. Uh-oh. Outbound on the Burgundy switch, going out interface number three. We look at that interface and say, gee, looks like here uh, right around noon, we we're dropping 6% of the packets. So that's definitely a suspicious interface as to what caused the problem. At this point, we click into the interface, read the plain English prescription, and really, within just a minute or two, we can tell the user, yeah, we know what happened, we're gonna get the problem fixed. So that's how you root cause resolve problems along a path. Now, we probably don't wanna stop troubleshooting just because we found one interface with a problem. We can keep looking at this and realize that the next router, the Santa Clara router, inbound, we're dropping a little bit of packets as well. It's running 100 meg half duplex. Well, that's a quick, easy fix. Also, on the outbound interface on that router, we're seeing that there's class-based QoS configured. There's two queues, a high priority voice queue and a default queue. The sad problem is there's no traffic going into that high priority voice queue. We can click into the queue and we'll see it has the wrong match condition. So it's that fast and easy to find out the root cause of, is this packet loss? Is this a queuing issue? Is this a problem on any of the involved interfaces along that path at any point in time? And with all of the error counters analyzed, you, nothing's outside of your view. How are you determining the path and does it take into account ECMP, equal cost? So. Yes. Yeah. So it does not take into account equal cost. You'd have to do two, run this report twice for each of those paths. What we're doing is we're analyzing the route tables, bridge tables, ARP cache, spanning tree along that path to find out what are the layer one, layer two, and layer three links used. But when you do have equal cost, you would have to run a second report. But again, that's only just a couple of minutes to run that second report to see what was the other path looking like at that time. Well, how would you distinguish the paths? The, the primary problem I'm aware of is the standard SNMP routing table only takes one entry. They blew it when they defined it. So yeah. it doesn't see ECMP paths. So Correct. if you put it in the same it... endpoints, you're going to get the same answer all the time, aren't you? Okay, through our product, okay. Yeah. What you do is you put in the source and destination and it's going to say, here's one path. What you would then do is you'd put for the alternate path, you'd program in and say, here's the alternate section of the network that I want you to show me the path through. So you'd have to put that in starting at that router. So you could do that, but again, you're limited by the fact that SNMP is not gonna show that path. Thank you. So I'm also assuming that uh, if you're checking the path between a pair of IPv4 addresses versus a pair of IPv6 addresses, that would be two separate checks as well. So I will admit to you, we have not done IPv6 yet. So this is all IPv4. And I guess what I'll ask you is, so far, I haven't heard from a lot of companies that they really want to do a lot of deep IPv6 stuff. 
They just say that's a complexity that we figure we'll, we'll do sometime down the road and they're just not dealing with it yet. They're kind of pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. Is that, that's, is that that's changed a lot with uh, th that's changed a lot with remote workers and remote routers because you're dealing with a lot of multi-point access to various services and when you're dealing with con with basically people at remote lo locations they're dealing with a lot more IPv6 than just a standard enterprise with bricks and mortar would be right but that's there's no SNMP on any of that stuff uh, there is when we're deploying routers to those locations to handle things. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll and, take that into to consideration. Tag on to that as well. Um, I've deployed networks using RFC 554940. So the internal of the network is all IPv6. But do you but put, transport an IPv4? But do you put routable IPv6 addresses on the management ports? I've heard everybody saying just make it a 10.0 IPv4 non routable for management. So no, I've, I've actually have worked with networks where the infrastructure is all IPv6 internal and IPv4 is at the edge as a service. Okay, okay. That's becoming more common. Okay, we'll start building in that direction then. Um, and that's what I love about these tech field days is you get a good interaction between, you know, we can say this is what we're hearing, but if you're hearing different things that feeds into what should we build? And the result is a better product that comes out. So some other capabilities is we have dynamic network mapping. You can put whatever background you want in place here, and this will do a live update uh, every five seconds of what's going on in your infrastructure. If links fail within five seconds, you're going to be aware of it. If links are heavily saturated within five seconds, you're going to be aware of it. Uh, the purpose of this is, is that you always want to be ahead of your users. So if, if there's an outage, if there's an overload, you're going to be able to say, yes, we're aware of it, even if you only became aware of it a few seconds before. We have automatically generated network diagramming built in. So as your network evolves and subnets get created, devices that get created, uh, this ends up building out automatically. You can download these to Visio. Uh, but it's effectively is you have a live look at your network. We include a correlation engine. If somebody says that 15 minutes ago, the network glitched, you can drop this down to 15 minutes and see all of the events that happened at that point in time. Interfaces that change status, devices that change status, interfaces or devices that had high packet loss, high utilization, so that you can correlate what occurred. Um, Back to the devices tab, for all of these devices, we have a wealth of information, including traffic information, POE information, how much power is available, how much power is being consumed, layer two spanning tree, uh, topology change information, root bridge information, full inventory, manufacturer, model number, serial number, software versions, internal descriptions on devices, and as I previously mentioned, we also do configuration management. So we can automatically back up configure, configurations on devices on a set schedule. We can also perform a backup if a device configuration changes. So if let's say one engineer goes in and puts a static route in on the core router, as soon as they exit out, uh, we're gonna go back up that config. And we back up the config, we do a diff against that, against the previous backup, and we send an email out to the entire team and say, this one engineer added a static route to the core router so that if people immediately start seeing problems, everyone's aware of what happened as well as what needs to be backed out. Additionally, we have the ability to do large scale deployment changes. So if you have like 100 lines of ACL that you wanna to deploy to all of the Cisco Nexus switches in the Chicago data center, you can do that in one fell swoop. The issues tab is gonna show everything that is broken on the network. These would be interfaces that are misconfigured. Uh, they have incorrect ARP, ARP cache entries, uh, incorrect subnet masks, missing default routes on routers, interfaces dropping or buffering packets. And again, the trick is if you knew everything your network knew, you'd march down this list and proactively fix all of these problems so that you can make a marked improvement in how your network operates simply because you know what the equipment knows. We include NetFlow. 
So any interfaces you wanna send NetFlow back on, you can click in to see who is using bandwidth here. And as you click in, you get to see protocols, ports, top 10 addresses, and all the flows. We also include IPAM, where we're gonna automatically find all the subnets in use. You can click on any subnet and see how is that subnet uh, laid out. We integrate with Microsoft DHCP to show the DHCP scope usage. Here we see these are all statically assigned addresses. As we get down to the purple section, this is the beginning of the DHCP scope. And now we get to see lease times on those scopes. On the VoIP side, we can tell you where your phones are. If, we, if somebody moves a phone, uh, we can alert on that. Uh, but generally it's being able to see where are those end devices connected. We automatically find all of your MOS scores and track them so that if you have a low point of MOS score that drops below 4.0, you can immediately click in and find out, was that low MOS score due to uh, packet loss? Was it due to jitter? Or was it due to a swelling of latency? All of your QoS interfaces show here so you can see how the QoS is performing. You can click into any one to be able to see uh, policy maps, class maps, and how the queues are, are operating. We can monitor SIP trunks. So we'll track latency, packet loss, and the status change, as well as the path change to that SIP trunk. If somebody says they had a problem two hours ago, you can click in and see the route tree. The middle row of the route tree will show the current path out to that SIP trunk endpoint. But we can see here, there was a huge amount of latency between these routers and this path was taken two hours ago. Okay, if this path was taken two hours ago with a huge amount of latency, let's see who chose this route. Well, this route here is still, it's managed by our SIP trunk provider. So we can call them up and say, hey guys, what were you doing that you shunted this traffic off to this alternate path that had high latency two hours ago? And they'll say, well, we had an outage. We had to route all your calls through Canada. Lastly, we have a license unlimited call simulator. Uh, the call what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're a, a South Texas company and you're routing through Canada, not necessarily the best path. <laughs> um, okay. So we have a license unlimited call simulator. Uh, this can simulate voice traffic really anywhere you want to go. I'm just going to, from where I am right now, just bounce a phone call off of Google's DNS server. Uh, and we can see what does call quality look like to any location. What this does is it takes a ping packet, puts it into a stream of ping packets, and then encapsulates in, inside of a G711 codec. And then we can optionally DSCP tag that. That way it has the same footprint on the network as a G711 call, yet you can do this test anywhere. So very quickly, you can find out, is it healthy in the LAN? Is it healthy across the WAN? Is it healthy all the way to the service? We can show if there's loss of DSCP, if there's out of order, if you have latency, jitter, packet loss problems, that way you can see what's going on. Very flexible, but this is really the perfect way to test and troubleshoot real-time protocols. Is the call something that I'm assuming that you have to be plugged into a port that will actually accept the DSCP? I mean, there are a lot of times when you set correct, the, set correct. But you can test for that. So if we if we do uh, turn on DSCP and we start the test, we will be able to report, hey, your DSCP is being stripped. So for example, here going all the way to Google's DNS server, we're getting DSCP preserved round trip, so it's not stripped, which is also great for being able to determine. If you put the, the, a PC on a voice VLAN and you do a test and say, okay, we're getting the DSCP preserved in the LAN, but across the WAN, that's where it's stripped. It allows you to very quickly determine where is that being dropped. Okay, uh, one thing to talk about is server monitoring. We include this. A lot of other companies, they'll charge a, a fortune for doing server monitoring. We figure this is part of the core package. Um, what we'll do is we're gonna monitor every server in the domain automatically. So if you add a new virtual machine into the domain, it's monitored. We just figure if it's in the domain, you need to know what's going on. So that way there's zero administration of our solution for new servers. 
So if the Fred server drops into the domain and we see a problem with it, we can say, okay, here's what CPU utilization is, memory, free disk space, network uh, uh, utilization. We get to see running processes to see, are those healthy? Who started the process? How much CPU or memory it's taking up? Uh, we get to see services. Are the services running? Are they stopped? In addition, as far as service alerts, what you can do is say, set up an alert for any service that changes status. When what we have is we have a learning machine and the learning machine is going to effectively send you an alert. Let's say it's the spooler service and you say, hey, if the spooler service starts or stops, it's gonna alert you. You can then say, I don't wanna see this alert again for this server, or I don't wanna see this alert again for the servers in this OU, or we don't use the spooler service. I don't wanna see this anywhere. Now, with the security problems around the spooler service, I think people want to know if the spooler service starts these days. But generally, it's you're able to train the system as to what is important versus what is not important. So that, again, it's a zero administration type of monitoring solution where you're able to teach it as to what is important versus what is not. Now you said you, domain, so that makes me think Windows systems. What about Unix-based systems, whether it be Linux, so, legacy Unix systems like Solaris or SCO or AIX or even VSDs. So those are monitored through the network part, which is effectively they're going to be using SNMP. Okay. Okay. Um, clients, we get to see here is everything connected to your network. Uh, if you're wondering, gee, we have some Dell machines, that's not standard. You can click on Dell and it's going to show here are every Dell machine in your environment, where they're plugged in, when it was plugged in. That way you can start understanding what is connected to your network and where. Cloud service monitoring, we can do the same sort of route tree technology on any sort of cloud service. So you can help troubleshoot. Why did somebody have a problem 30 minutes ago with Salesforce? You can click in, end up seeing, gee, uh, yeah, you were load balanced to another server that had an extremely high latency 32 minutes ago. Uh, yeah, that's going to definitely be a problem as to why you're having slowdowns. The last thing I'll talk about is our ability to predict things. So if you think about the vast amount of information we're collecting on the network, we figure if we pick all of that information up, you can do some really interesting things with it. So our first predictor is a cabling predictor. What this is gonna do is predict where is your cabling going to go bad in your infrastructure? What we're doing is we're looking for symbol errors. And what symbol errors are is it means your ethernet chipset had to do single bit error correction to fix a physical layer problem in order to pass a valid frame onto layer two. So you see some of these interfaces have one or two or nine symbol errors, no big deal. But 17,000 symbol errors, you've definitely got a cabling issue going on. At this point, you click into the interface, you find out, oh, that's Bob's cubicle. Let's go walk into Bob's cubicle and find out Bob's been backing his desk chair over his Ethernet station cord five times a day. At this point, you can replace the station cord and get the problem resolved before a single packet was even dropped. The second predictor is a bandwidth predictor. And here what we're doing is we're looking at every interface in the infrastructure, finding out which interfaces are the most heavily utilized and are trending towards 100% utilization the soonest. Then we give you a prediction date. That way, if you look at the date and say, oh, that's a couple of weeks away, no big deal. But if it's a couple of days away, then you wanna dig into the NetFlow information and find out, is this legitimate business traffic? If it is legitimate business traffic, then you have a couple of days to say, let's get some bandwidth upgrades so that we don't create problems for our users. So that's pretty much it. So you guys think this is a better way of, of root cause troubleshooting networks rather than having a manual process? Definitely so. I, I, I do have a question of a potential other feature. Uh, since Path Solutions is already able to interface with the infrastructure devices, is there support or thought of support to leverage Path Solutions as a config backup repository and maybe even config difference uh, reporter? Oh, we, we have that already. Is that, that in, in there? Our, okay, that, I didn't catch that. That's in our that. automation. Yeah, so we're okay. backing up configs. We're doing diffs against configs. Okay. Uh, so that's already in there. Awesome, thank you. Great minds think alike. We're, we're already ahead of that game. <laughs> yeah, that's the comment I had was, it's impressive that you're 
uh, you've got a bunch of ease of use factors there where it automatically pulls in the data and it automatically stores it and makes it visible because visibility really helps, but also that you've got enough uh, in the way of tying it together. Uh, and I noticed you didn't say the word AI once. Um, it's not magic. Yeah, a AI is a great marketer's term, but if you look at some of the truth, it's it's there's some smoke and uh, uh, mirrors going on for a lot of the AI that's that exists out there. Well, or they're doing logic chains that could easily just be uh, interpreted as if then code. Is there any um, published API that you could use to fetch data from from your solution? Yeah, so we have uh, it's everything is 100% RESTful JSON. So we have a, a document that describes here's all the fetches you can do so that you can interact with other other tools. Question about the SNMP calls to the various equipment for gathering information. Is that all standard OIDs or are there vendor specific ones involved? I'm just kind of wondering if, if we point this thing at a generic Linux box that we're using as a router, are we gonna be able to gather information off of it? So I'm gonna say yes and yes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll interrogate the device to say, what are you? Uh, what model number, what manufacturer? And based upon that, we have built-in templates that will say, oh, you are a Cisco Nexus switch, therefore you should support these other private MIBs. And we will start digging in and getting that information. Because again, what we figured is, what we're mirroring is any seasoned engineer would say, oh, you have a Cisco switch, go get the QoS MIBs out of the private area, go get these other MIBs out of these other areas. And so it's it's the laundry list of what would you want to know about this device? And so we've built this in based upon Cisco Nexus code, Cisco iOS XE code, Extreme, Brocade, pretty much every vendor under the sun that we've built in. Our, our company's been around for, for 13, 14 years now. Um, and so we've built all these vendors knowledge in, but we also have a fallback. And the fallback is if we don't know what a device is, then we go out and start feeling the device out. And feeling the device out is we're going to start going after those standard MIBs to say, do you support a bridge table? No. Do you support a host MIB? Oh, yes, you do. Okay, let's start digging into some of that information. And so it's, it's this feeling out process that allows us to say, here's what a network engineer would want to know about a box. And I'll, I'll admit, we don't do 100% of everything, but if we cover 90% of what a network engineer would want to know, then you're not spending your time configuring a tool, you're spending your time solving problems. And for the 10% additional, we include a full MIB browser so you can go through and hunt through and say, I also wanna monitor this, I also wanna monitor this. So you can still have your cake, eat it too, and have all the information done so that you're finished with a meal in the first hour of deployment. So if you're leveraging, so you're leveraging the vendor specific stuff, but not necessarily requiring it where it's not available. Correct. And, and getting all the information you can out of it. Now, is, are those custom templates uh, user manageable if, if they're needed? You can create, well, okay. So you can create your own templates to say, if we have these types of devices, we wanna collect this additional information on. So you can add to it. You can't subtract from it because our core is our core. Okay, no, that makes sense. But there, there is custom template functionality available when you're going yeah. beyond the pale. Right. Yeah, admittedly, the, the Linux, box used as a router was a hyperbolic example, but it, it showed what I was trying to talk about. Thank you. If you knew what your network knew, you'd, you'd be further ahead of the game. And that's really what we're endeavoring folks to be able to do.